I'm not sure if this is streaming yet, so I'm just going to give it just a second. Hello. This is Pastor's Coffee, only instead of that handsome face that you usually see on my husband, you're getting me this morning. And I just want to say good morning to you, and I hope that you're having a blessed day. I'm just going to be sharing a few highlights from some of the truths that I shared on Sunday. If you didn't see that service, I encourage you to go back and watch and listen to it because I really believe God gave me some things that will help us. There were, was also a prophetic word that I shared during that time that God gave me that very uh, night before that to share with everyone that would be at the service or watching and tuning in. And I just think God is getting us ready for a new season, something new that he's about to do. And there are some special and important truths that he wants us to hold on to as we're moving into this new season. So this last week I began to share about imitation, imitation, imitating Christ, because that's a series that my husband's been doing. And so when you think about imitating someone, if you're going to copy what I'm doing right now, if I said copy every movement that I make, where would your eyes have to be? Could you turn your back to the screen and still follow my movements? The answer is no. You need to fix your eyes on the one that you want to mimic, the one you want to imitate, to resemble, to reproduce. If you want to do what they're doing, you have to fix your eyes on them. And in this new season, it's so important that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, that we are looking at him, that he is our focus, and that we're not trying to copy anyone else or anything else in this world, but we are totally focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and on doing what he says to do. And in his word, he's taught us so many things about what his original design is for um life and for how we're to live, what our character is to be, how we're to relate to one another, what we are to value in this life. It's not just copying the things that we are comfortable copying, but it's copying all of the things, everything about Jesus, everything that's written in his word. It's learning how to imitate Christ so that when people see us, they'll go, whoa, was that Jesus or was that so-and-so? because there's such a, a, a mimicking of such a display of his character, of his life and of, of his love right there. And that's what we want to do. Now I showed you on Sunday, some pictures and I had Pastor Ron come up front and put his face forward, his best face forward and very handsome face. And then I drew a copy of it. And I said, now, if you want to do the best imitation of this face on a drawing pad in front of you, are you going to look at the copy I made or are you going to look at the original? Obviously, looking at the original will help you to draw a better replica of what you are seeing. But if you're doing a copy from what I've designed, what I see in him, then it's only going to be a copy of my copy and not a copy of the original. I then took that same drawing that I had made of my handsome husband and I changed the countenance to look very angry and a little bit silly. And I asked everyone, does this really represent my husband? And everyone said, no, it does not. Because I was replicating, I was, I was expressing him in a way that didn't look like Jesus. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. He told us very specifically that we're to imitate those who inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. People that display the character of Christ, not those who are not replicating his attitude, his behavior, his speech. Now, when you look at God's original design and what we're to be reproducing or, or imitating here in the earth, you see in Genesis chapter one, let's go to chapter two, actually. Two things that I want to highlight here again. It says in verse 8 of chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. In verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. The word tend there means to work, to service, to till. And the word keep means to hedge about, protect, guard, and be a watchman. And we learned Sunday that God has established a fenced-in place of intimacy with him. 
from which intimacy with others would be guarded and protected and flow. Are we guarding? You know, when, when God put the man and the woman in this garden, it, it wasn't just so that they would have all this beauty around them and this wonderful protected space of, of just no problems and nothing going wrong and no challenges. He wouldn't have created a protected space and told them to guard and to keep it unless he was insinuating to them, there will be an enemy who will try to take what you have here, who will try to infiltrate and destroy what you have here. So he was giving them a warning. Now he'd already told them in Genesis one, I've given you authority over every living thing. So they didn't have to fear whatever it was that would try to infiltrate, but they needed to keep their guard up and they needed to watch. What were they really guarding though? They were guarding this place that God created for them to have intimacy with him and with one another. God prioritized this intimacy and he said, guard it. Keep this, what we have together, Keep it safe. Keep it protected. Don't let anything infiltrate and destroy it. Don't let anything distract you from it, but guard it and keep it. And this intimacy, prioritize this intimacy that you have with one another and tend and keep that. And to God, this was their greatest act of service in his, in his original design was intimacy with God, intimacy with one another, and a guarding of that intimacy, a priority of taking care of it. You notice that God never once specifically mentioned things that were in the garden that they needed to protect. It was everything that he'd given them. But the number one thing they had there was intimacy with God. And God wants us to value our time with him in the same way. He wants us to value intimacy with him and with one another the same way. Now we know what happened in Genesis chapter uh, three, the man and the woman are tempted just as God warned them, there was an, uh, uh, an infiltration of the enemy. He appeared as a serpent, as a created being. They'd been given authority over him. They could have told him to be quiet, to leave, to drop dead, and he would have had to do it, but he didn't do it. Man and woman did not do that. Instead, they were more concerned with gratifying themselves than with protecting their relationship with God or protecting their relationship with one another. They put the fact, it says that Eve looked at it and she saw, wow, this is really pleasurable for food. This is gonna make me better. It was all about me. And she was willing to sacrifice this intimacy with God, let down her guard. And, and therefore sacrificing intimacy with her husband, not guarding and protecting that because of something she wanted for herself. And isn't that the same thing that happens to us today? And the man was silent. He valued his peace maybe more than intimacy with God. Rather than guarding and protecting his family, his bride, this intimacy that they had and the intimacy they had with God, he chose silence because perhaps it seemed the easier route. It wasn't as inconvenient. It wasn't as troublesome. It wouldn't require confrontation. And so he was just quiet. And both of them lost something so precious that day with God and with one another. By the, by the end of chapter three, they're arguing with one another just a few verses away. They're hiding from one another. They're no longer, their intimacy is marred and flawed and they're hiding, hiding parts of themselves now. They feel too vulnerable to be totally themselves with one another and, and they're hiding from God and that intimacy has been broken. And I want you to see what happens when we fail to value and to treasure and to guard and keep our intimacy with God. It affects our relationship then with one another and it passes on into future generations. Because if you look forward into Genesis chapter four, you can see Cain and Abel and you know that story. I encourage you to read it on your own later. But in Genesis chapter four, their sons come before the Lord with a sacrifice and, and somehow Abel, the shepherd, the keeper of the sheep, he was a keeper of the sheep. He understood I'm to guard, I'm to tend, I'm to protect. He understood, he valued what God had instructed them to do. And his offering was pleasing to the Lord. You know, we can dissect why God 
liked his offering and didn't like Cain's offering. But the Bible tells us clearly that God is not like man. He doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And I really believe that the reason that Abel's offering was accepted and the reason Cain's was not is because it was not given from the heart. It was not in his heart to worship God, to honor God, to maintain intimacy with God. He was just putting in his time. And so God corrects Cain in a desire to bring him into that place of intimacy and right relationship with him, not to punish him. In fact, when, when, when Cain becomes so angry and irate, and, and the Bible describes that if you tear it down, that word all the way to its root, meaning his face was flaming, he's breaking out in a sweat, he's gritting his teeth, he's furious. And God warns him, that anger that anger desires to have you, it desires to be your boss and take you where you don't need to go. And he says, so, so you need to rule over that anger. You need to be the boss of that anger. Don't let it run with you. But, but Cain valued his feelings, what he wanted in that moment, more than his relationship with God. So he refused to repent. He refused to receive counsel. So intimacy with God, he didn't tend and keep that. And he didn't tend and keep the relationship that he had with his brother. He didn't guard and protect it. He valued his, his anger more than he valued intimacy within his brother. And in the end, he killed his brother. He no longer even had any value of life. In fact, when God confronts him about what he did, he says this, am I my brother's keeper? That word keeper comes from the same word when God told man to guard and to keep. He's, he no longer even sees that as part of his life calling. It's all about self. And that's such a dangerous place to be. And, you know, when you read these stories, you can feel kind of helpless because you can look around. And you can say, wow, how am I ever going to get to that place where I truly guard and keep my relationship with God above all others? Well, we know that today we have the help of the Holy Spirit and we have the word of God to renew our minds so that we can begin to think like God and value what he values. The more you take in the word of God, the more time you spend in his presence, the more you become transformed and conformed into his image. So we have that. But even before Jesus came and the Holy Spirit was sent, I want to show you that it was possible, it was possible to choose to be that expression, to be that imitation of Christ, of God in the earth, to, to follow his original design. If you go quickly to chapter 12, and I'll finish here. Genesis chapter 12, and it's a story of Abraham, and, and God calls Abraham out. Go to chapter 13. God has called Abraham out. He took his wife, Sarah. He took his nephew, Lot, all their servants, all their belongings. They moved to the land where God told them to go. They had a promise from God. He was totally obedient to follow God to that new destination. When they got there, they were so blessed by the Lord that soon there was uh, quarreling happening between the servants of Lot and the servants of of Abram because there was just too many flocks and herds and not enough ground in one location to take care of them all. And so this is what Abraham does. Now, remember, Abram's the one that received, his name was Abram before at this point in scripture. Later, we know him as Abraham. But, but here's what he does. Now, remember, he's the one who received the promise from God. Lot's just along for the ride, receiving the blessings because of association. <laughs> But and because Abram cho chose to include him in this experience with God. And so, so he's actually not the privileged one. It's Abraham that is the privileged one. He's the oldest. He carries that patriarchal position in the family, which would give him the, the like a king or a chief of the family to be able to make the decisions and have what is best and be served first and all of that. So he's all these rights and privileges. And, and instead, here's what happens as their servants are quarreling. It says in verse eight, so Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Isn't that an amazing heart? Abram put intimacy and relationship before his personal rights, 
wants, or even his needs. He guarded his relationship with Lot, wanting that more than what was best or right or convenient for himself. And he didn't have the help of the Holy Spirit the way you and I do today. He just had a word from God and he was understanding the character of his God. And that just so touches my heart when I think about who he is. And I think about Abram and he had all these rights and privileges, but in that moment he said, you know, there's a lot of things I could say right now. There's a lot of things I could do right now. Um, I could send you back. You, I, this is my land. God promised it to me and my descendants. And you're not really my descendant. You're my brother's descendant. I could send you back. And then I'd have this land all to myself. I mean, he could think about self the way Adam and Eve did. But he chose not to. And he chose to value relationships. Intimacy with God, intimacy with Lot, maintaining that relationship above everything else. And that speaks volumes. And if he could do it, that tells me that we can do it too. Let me close with this verse. Later in chapter 13, look how God responded after that. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as a dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Wow. This is an amazing portion of scripture. And it tells me that God really likes it when we follow his original design, when we imitate his original plan, take away all of man's warped depictions of who God is and what he wants for family and what he wants for us as believers to share and, and how we're to see one another. And, and he makes it about relationship, that that is the priority. And so our challenge today is to prioritize, you could probably hear bells in the background, that's my phone, I apologize. But our challenge today is to prioritize relationship above everything else, to prioritize that above what we want, what we feel or what we think. And I challenge you to look at the life of Abram and that pivotal moment in his relationship with Lot where it could have been totally broken, but instead he chose to maintain it and let it challenge your own life this week. So I'm just going to pray for you and for me, and then I'm going to let you go. God, thank you so much for these few moments with my friends and all of our Potter's House family. And I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would bless each one and help us to See in one another what you see and to value our relationship with you and our relationship with one another more than anything else, more than gratifying self, more than being right, more than convenience, more than anything. Help us to truly value one another the way Abram valued Lot, the way you have valued us. We love you. We thank you for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all, and I'd love to see some comments later. Welcome and goodbye <laughs> from Pastor's Coffee. Talk to you soon.